when we were on these trips back east with my dad being in the space industry, we stopped at Gettysburg. And this park ranger came out with his Smokey the Bear hat. This park ranger gave a talk, and then he went in and he got in a Civil War uniform and came out with a musket and fired it, and I said, that's for me. You, so you truly intended to do that when you grew up? I just said, that's for me, but I didn't know how I was going to get there. But that whole idea of working in a national park like Gettysburg, it was, it was just like, how do I do this? Daniel Martinez has been captivated by military history since childhood, and he followed his passion. Today, he's chief historian at the World War II Valor in the Pacific National Monument, which preserves and interprets the stories of the Pacific War, including the events at Pearl Harbor. Daniel Martinez, next on Long Story Short. Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox is Hawaii's first weekly television program produced and broadcast in high definition. Aloha mai kako, I'm Leslie Wilcox. Daniel Martinez has been the chief historian at Pearl Harbor since 1989, where he keeps history alive for the many visitors from around the world who come to see where World War II began for America. History has always been an important part of Daniel's life, starting from his youth growing up in California. His German and Mexican grandparents shared stories of their lives, which started him on the path that would later lead him to become an historian. What are some of the formative uh, influences in your life, including um, how you got started? Oh, I, without a doubt, my grandfather. My grandfather taught me how to fish and uh, found out he was at Pearl Harbor and he had this interest in the American West and he was a miner on my gr grandfather and, and grandmother's side. In particular, on my grandmother's side, they grew up in Boise, Idaho. They were first immigrants to come in the 1870, late 1870s, became gold miners, and then later one was a sheriff and so we had all of that. So on both sides of the family with my, my father's was more humble. Um, my, my grandfather came from Mexico, from the area of Guadalajara, and immigrated here um, legally through the Southern Pacific Railroad. He was one of the workers, and that's how my, my dad ended up in Lo being born in Lone Pine, California, one of nine children, and, uh, and my love for railroad and that history, uh, especially I'm a big Southern Pacific fan, came from that. And then my dad, my dad was in the Navy and, and my dad uh, served uh, in the Korean War. My Aunt Jo was the first one on my mother's side to take me to a library. And when I was five years old and picked up my first book, which was Custer's Last Stand, there were always these influences on reading and going to places where events happen. When you say, you, you know, you're, you know, history really imbued your family, mm -hmm. you, you had a sense of that. Did you say that to yourself? You know, history is important to me or was that not a known specialization or concept? If, if my mom was alive, she'd probably have more of a description of it because when I was little, I had toy soldiers and I would recreate battles. I would read books. I would, I would be actively involved in watching films on history. I, I think it was just something that was instinctively there and thank God my family endorsed it and, and uh, not only that, uh, took me to a number of historic places that were like these deviations off the road. And so I just, I, I don't know, I think my rudder was fixed and I was headed that way. You're cross-cultural, Mexican, German. Yeah, and you know, the difficult part was that I didn't realize this because uh, you and I grew up in, in a world that was not as, as judgmental, and here in Hawaii, even less, but it was called interracial marriage. And that's what my, my, my parents' marriage was, and they ran off and got married. Because their, their family wouldn't uh, support the match? Oh, no, I, I, on both sides. Uh, you know, my, my grandfather on the Mexican side was hoping that my dad was gonna marry a Mexican girl, and I'm sure on my, I know for a fact on my mother's side they wish the same, but the love overcomes a lot and they ran off and got married and then when I came along all was forgiven and the families were joined. And so um, my grandfather who was so opposed to this on my mom's side became so close to my uh, dad that they, he was like a second father. Did you ever have the sensation of having to pick one, you know, racial background over the other? 
You know, I didn't have a choice. The last name was Martinez. You know, I went to Catholic high school, and I went through a little bit of hazing of that. And I had a cousin uh, named Paul, Paul Gomez, who was a scholar and, and a great guy. And he just said, hey, just roll with it. Just roll with it. Don't be upset of it. Just be proud of it. And I always have been. And when I came to Hawaii, one of the things that uh, touched me a great deal was the acceptance of peoples here. But people always want to know what you are, even if they're not prejudiced against right. you. They want to know. I tell them, I, like, I'm sort of. You're Hapa. Hapa, <laughs> you know, and then they get that. And, and so I'm very proud of our, our, you know, German English background, especially my, what my uh, grandparents on that side did. When your grandfather moved to Hawaii, why? He was a miner. Yeah, he, he, the thing was that there was a company, a big company, uh, and everybody knew it at the time, called Morrison Knutson, and it was located in Boise, Idaho, and they were rounding up all of these miners and construction workers. They had been given uh, contracts to build military bases throughout the Pacific, Wake Island, uh, Midway, all over. And my grandfather was in his 30s at the time, so he was relatively mature, and he had just remarried, and, um, and he saw this opportunity, and it was, so they wanted this work. They needed tunnelers. They needed people that knew how to work with dynamite, my grandfather. And what they were going to build was 20 of these that are basically 20 stories deep as well. And uh, I forget the circumference, but it's, close to 75 yards in circumference, and these tanks were going to be literally blasted out of the lava rock on Red Hill, and then they would use like an iron basket around it, and then ignite that, and then use cement and, and build it. Now, they built these things, you know, from the bottom, you know, kind of the bottom up, and many men fell, and when you fall in there, even despite there's water, it doesn't come out well when you're falling. Eight or nine stories, you know, two, you know over 200 feet. And so my grandfather worked on that, and then my, my mother came over in 41, early 41, went to school, living the dream, as I say, that's what I often say, living the dream here in Hawaii, and then, uh, you know, went to, went to school. Well, wait a minute, Go, going back to those storage tanks, so your grandfather is working with people who are dying. Yes, this whole thing that they were doing was secret. They tried to keep it as secret as possible. I don't know how they did that, because, but they just didn't want people talking about it. Because but there was were, dynamite going off in Red Hill. Yeah, but it was like a rumble because it's underneath the ground. And they were taking all the tailings, and they were bo not pulling them out of there. They were spilling them into the valley there. And oh. you can still see some of those tailings where the cement factory is now today. But, but so he would go back, and he couldn't even tell your grandmother. He just said he was doing tunneling. Was he there throughout the entire yes, 20 he was. tanks? Yes, yeah, How long did that take? It took on to almost till 1944. And you see, my family, um, my mom and, and her sisters, a baby, and my Aunt Janelle, who went to Roosevelt High School, they were sent back on, the, I think, the Mariposa and uh, went back to San Francisco. From there, they went back to Boise and waited. And then my grandfather returned, and he needed to find work. And he knew that they needed the war effort needed talc, and he knew where talc was. And so he went there, and he established his family there and opened a talc mine in the White Mountains. And my mom went to Lone Pine High School and met one Rudy Martinez. For the next six years after he graduated from college, Daniel Martinez taught high school in the winter, and during the summer, he worked for the National Park Service as a seasonal ranger at the Little Bighorn Battlefield. The Park Service offered him a full-time position at the USS Arizona Memorial, which he readily accepted. Although his grandparents had told him stories about living in Hawaii during the war, he was unprepared for what awaited him. Although I lived in California, all my friends used to go to Hawaii in the summers. I never did. And I came here for the first time, you know, in 1985 with 14 boxes and, and my girlfriend. And we were there at the airport and we didn't know what we were in for. But it was, uh, it was quite an experience adjusting to Hawaii because there wasn't, there wasn't a lot of stores that we have now. And, and, and it was expensive and I was very low grade. So I, we, we I worked some of the whole second jobs and things like that to make it make my way through. Where did you live when you first arrived? I lived in IA, like, and I lived right above the high school, and I didn't have a car then, so I walked to work. So 
uh, and then later got established and, and life changed and evolved and I was adopted because my girlfriend could not, she couldn't hack it. She, she went home. I came home and I had a, like a dear child letter. <laughs> And the family that I stayed with, um, we, I lived on the lower end of a, of a home, so it was, a, it was like a, a little Ohana. And uh, they were just really uh, you know, shocked that I had a dear John, and they were so consoling. But I couldn't afford it anymore because we had, so uh, Clinton Connie, who was a park ranger at the memorial, said, come with me. And uh, he took care of me, and I ended up living in Waimanalo with another uh, Japanese-American fella and who worked for Hawaiian Tel, and I learned to be Hawaiian. I ate food that I thought I could never eat, did things that I never thought I could do. I learned how to bodyboard in Makapu, and, uh, and that was uh, thrilling. And the food teaches you a lot about history of the islands, too. It does. Too. Uh, I never quite caught on to OPE, but I gave it a, a good attempt. But I, I started to fall in love with some of the Hawaiian foods, and, and it was the, if I can, digress, the simple story of, of this kind of generosity and culture here that I w was unknown to me was that uh, when we lived, we lived in close to the mountain in Waimanalo. So when it rained, uh, the roof was metal and it was just a racket, but you get used to it. And then when we would go fishing or anything, uh, the fish that we got, we would drop off to some of the neighbors who had their farms there. And the next day, there'd be vegetables or fruits left there. And it was just the kind of warmth and generosity that didn't see that that like that in Los Angeles. When you said your girlfriend couldn't hack it, d did you consider saying, okay, this is really complex for no. me and I don't think I'm going to do it? No, because I had fallen in love with the story at the USS Arizona Memorial and, and the fact that both sides of my family were at Pearl Harbor. Yeah, I, and I had fallen in love with the ethics of the National Park Service. There was just no turning back for me. And I was told that if I wanted to be a permanent ranger because I had come here for that reason that I needed to go to the law enforcement academy and I did so. I left here. I went to Santa Rosa, California, went to the sheriff's academy there and became a law enforcement ranger for the National Park Service. And on the day of graduation, I got a call from the chief ranger and he hired me. Uh, and um, that was the beginning of that career. And it was... Um, it's, it was one of those magical moments that I had arrived. You know, most times when people do go into history, it's with the idea of teaching it, getting advanced degrees so they can teach it at mm -hmm. the, the college or, right. or a higher ed level. Right. Uh, but that was not your course, and you remained uh, employed in it continuously. Yeah, I, you know, the bottom line is, is that we at the, that engage in this, whether we work in a museum or work for the national parks or state parks, we're public historians and uh, that, in, that are have a history field and we deal with the public and that in itself defines that we are educators almost at every moment because when people come to the national parks or like our, to our site um, they're they're there to experience it and we're there to inform and illustrate why the site is important and and how it fit into the national past and at a place like Pearl Harbor, you get more material that you can vet from listening to people. Right, and 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 we have we have a story beyond um, uh, the tragic events of December seventh. Now we're uh, World War II, Valor of the Pacific National Monument. Mm -hmm. It includes all of the Pacific War. You know, one of the things I used to love about going to uh, Pearl Harbor uh, in my um, I, even when I was a young adult mm -hmm. um, was getting to talk to people, volunteers, who had actually been at Pearl Harbor when the bombing occurred, yeah. uh, men who, who, who had experienced it. Are there any volunteers now who do that? They must be there in their are, 90s. Yeah, there are. There's uh, one who was a young man, uh, I, believe, I believe his name is Robert Lee. He lived right in in Halava, at Halava Landing. He looked out, his, his home was on the edge of Pearl Harbor, right there in that kind of Iaea Bay right there. And he watched the attack from his second story on Battleship Row. Wow. But we're talking about individuals in their 90s, and that is our fading resource. So. Because before, the the, um, the survivors would walk you around briskly and I know. tell you Don't this you and tell you that. Don't you miss those days? But yeah, they must have a, a more limited um, circumference these days. Well, I was a volunteer in the parks coordinator in 1987, 88, and I had over 25 Pearl Harbor survivors 
that volunteered through the week. And, uh, and it's just amazing that that we have seen since that time, the, you know, the passing of a generation. There's also the other group that's right here, the civilian mm -hmm. eyewitnesses and those that worked at Pearl Harbor or the airfields or at home. I think that the, the biggest connection we made with the civilian community here, and I'm very proud of it because it was a movement to make sure all of the casualties were recorded, were the civilian casualties. And at the time, to get those records was very difficult because they were held by the health department here. Mm -hmm. Mayor Fossey, God bless him, he, he paved the way for us to get their records. They didn't want to release them to us. We got all the civilian records, uh, death records. Of the civilians who were killed, um, I think it came out later that much of that was from friendly fire. It right. Was, uh, we found out two... was defending itself. Yeah, we found out two things, that it was, it was actually 48 civilians. Later we'd find one more, 49 civilians were killed in the attack. Most of them, almost 85, 86 percent, killed by friendly fire. And the definition of friendly fire, which is a, a strange term for it, was that as we were firing up at the planes, the shells were either not being fused properly or faulty, and they were landing all over Honolulu, Waikiki area. And in, when it, that happened, uh, many of the people believed they were being bombed. Remember, the planes are still flying over. And so um, that's what my mother remembers, the houses being bombed, and it was friendly fire coming down. You know, there are so many myths about Pearl Harbor, mm -hmm. in including some I grew up with. Some of them were dispelled after I, I attended school in mm -hmm. Hawaii. And I know one of them was, um, you know, the Japanese planes didn't come through Kole Kole Pass to get to Pearl Harbor. I know. I thought of that for years, and I'd drive by those mountains and think, oh, that's right where the planes came in. Oh, yeah. No. It, it, it was, uh, that myth um, had some truth to it, um, and that's one of the things I found out in doing some of the research about it was eyewitnesses watching the attack, in particular on Wheeler and Schofield in that area, saw the planes, but the planes were turning at the base of the mountains, not flying through it. And the Japanese were always uh, kind of, when I interviewed them, why do they think we would do that? Because the main strike force flew down from Kayana Point all the way and turned over Makakilo and then broke up in their attacks at Hickam and Pearl Harbor and Eva. One group came down the center of the island over Haleiwa and moved up and attacked Wheeler Field, but they circled around. And so film kind of endorsed that the book and film from here to eternity somewhat endorsed that myth. Then tour guides caught onto it and then it became part of the uh, story. And they took people out there to Koli Koli Pass. Now the pass itself is historic, but uh, the film Tora Tora Tora, you see them flying right through the pass. So uh, Hollywood uh, in many, many ways instills and certifies and embosses some of our myths. So something that happened all those decades ago mm -hmm. is still a moving target in, in terms of learning about it and, um, and, and memorializing it. I'll tell you, Leslie, the more you know, the less you know. And that's been my case. I, you know, everybody says, oh, you're the, one of the experts on Pearl Harbor. And you know, I, 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 can, I think what I could say safely is I know where to find it but it, it's just an evolution still occurring. So long after I leave my position, there'll be someone that will find more history and more angles of that. And that's been my case. Every time I go to work, there's going to be something that's new. Teaching visitors about history is an important part of Daniel Martinez's job, but there are other aspects of his work that go beyond uncovering new facts and correcting misconceptions. There is the ongoing story of the consequences and the lessons of war that even today continue to inform us and affect our lives. One of the things that I've been blessed with is I'm the internment officer for, the, uh, for what takes place in the Arizona. To see how the Navy, or in the case if it's a Marine, how they honor and work with us on that ceremony. And when the families come there and, and we take, I take the urn down and the family members are with me, and then I turn that urn over to the family member that's appointed by the rest to do that, and then that person gives it to the diver. That is a moment. 
you've gotten to meet so many of the survivors mm -hmm. of Pearl Harbor attack, and um, I, you know they come every. Many have come over the years. Some have volunteered mm -hmm. here. Some have moved here. And you've you've done you've conducted oral history interviews with a lot of them. So I, I just wonder, for those who went through th those horrific times, I mean they saw their fellow soldiers uh, and, and other professionals just. I mean, they saw such terrible um, ha yeah, um, yeah. carnage. What were their lives like after surviving this? After the war, no matter what horrific circumstance they went through, whether they were witness people being killed or wounded themselves or nearly killed themselves, they wanted to move on with their lives. Think about it. Many of them were young. I did my first oral history with my grandfather, and he agreed to do it, but not, he wasn't wild about it. And I couldn't understand it, so I thought, and I, so I started the interview and I had a little recording machine, you know, and microphone, and I get into the whole Pearl Harbor stuff, and he gets up in the interview and walks away. And he said, that's it, that's it, I'm, that's all. And my grandmother, you can hear in the background, saying, you know, no, go back, you know. So he, he got up, I think, three times and walked away. It, it wasn't until... Uh, I started doing oral history interviews on my own in the late 80s that I understood what I was dealing with. He had never told anybody about it. And he had seen a young Hawaiian boy that worked on his crew wounded. He had to dive for cover because he was in the area of uh, Mary Point Landing. It was, that was ground zero for the torpedo attack. They flew right up that channel. And so he was seeing things and remembering things that he had not talked about. And, and as a result, um, he was reliving it. I see. And I didn't know that. And so I, I, couldn't, I couldn't understand at that time. And it took several years for me to get from the university here that um, I was going into an area of his remembrance that was extremely difficult and he was reliving it and he remembered the Arizona exploding but he didn't know it was the Arizona he just saw a ship explode and the concussion rocked them there and he remembered that he stayed there as a Navy federal worker pulling bodies out of IA Bay and placing them on the landing at IA for identification and never got over how young the faces were. Mm -hmm. And he remembered going through a darkened and panicked downtown Honolulu and seeing people and behavior that he never had seen before. People were frightened and they were scared. They were running lights and they were driving up to the sidewalks. And, and he just said it was crazy. And nobody remembers or really talks about that, but it indeed happened. And so when he got home late at night, we were now under martial law and it was blackout. And they huddled in their home in Kaimaki like so many others did, not knowing what the next day would bring, sensing there would be Japanese soldiers in their front yard. And that was just the beginning of the uh, martial law experience in Hawaii that fortunately for my family, they were lucky enough to leave, although sadly, and be in a place where there was a lot more freedom. So for the people of Hawaii, I mean, they're often not really congratulated for their, their own sustainability and courage and effort in the war effort, just sustaining themselves under martial law. And so um, he, the one thing that my grandfather witnessed that he couldn't believe also was that, and I tell the story now to a lot of visitors, is that after the attack, um, suddenly the workers that were of, of Japanese ancestry were being attacked and called names by local people that worked on the project, mm -hmm. which just seems crazy, but it was crazy. And so it got to such a point that there were fights and the inability for crews to work together and uh, ethnic groups from Hawaii um, now even uh, that had been their friends were no longer their friends, so the crews were segregated. There was a Japanese American crew. This went on for several months and then as feelings subsided, yeah, they fear work. is a terrible thing. It drives bad behavior. We see it. Yeah. yeah, and it drove some bad behavior. But it was one of those untold stories that I, he mentions on his interview. And in doing so, gave me a glimpse of what the, the kind of um, 
fear, as you say, uh, sustained itself in the, in the weeks and months after Pearl Harbor. We learn the human experience of history and war through the testimonies of witnesses and survivors. Daniel Martinez's passion for gathering and perpetuating these stories keeps them alive so we can heal from the emotional wounds of the past and understand history. Mahalo to Daniel Martinez of Kapole for teaching us through stories. And mahalo to you for joining us. For PBS Hawaii and Long Story Short, I'm Leslie Wilcox. Ahuiho. For audio and written transcripts of all episodes of Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox, visit pbshawaii.org. To download free podcasts of Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox, go to the Apple iTunes Store or visit pbshawaii.org. I remember we were making a film about Pearl Harbor on September 11th, 2001. We were in Washington, D.C., not more than 15 miles away from the Pentagon and these suits come in and he leans over and said we just got Pearl Harbor in New York and that's going on while we're having while these you are images, remembering Pearl Harbor while we're remembering Pearl Harbor we were ushered out we could see the smoke did you stay the in the building? We, they kept us there and uh, they moved us into the cafeteria lobby area and we watched the second plane go in. It was profound because we were scheduled to fly that day uh, on Flight 77, that plane that went into the Pentagon, but it, the reservation was changed. It's never been lost on me that I had a second chance in life. And uh, so September 11th is, I guess, my, my, uh, my touch with uh, Pearl Harbor-like event.